we're talking after Milan or Saturday, and we'll just a few minutes after it's happened. Um, let's have a chat about what happened with that. Well, it's fresh in our minds. The winner, of course, was Jasper Philipser. It was a sort of heart attack last 10 minutes or so. I still can't piece together what I'm going to help me for one. <laughs> oh, but I just think UAE messed up today. I, I really do think UAE messed up. I think they took it on too early. I think everyone knew they were going to attack. Everyone knew they were going to like light it up to say. But I just think they took it on way too early, got stuck in too early. And by the time they got to, to, to Tripressa, which is the ultimate bit for everyone, mm. and especially for UAE, they had riders Tim Wellens and Del Toro moving up. So that took them a kilometre. They had Kobe on the front trying to set the best tempo he could. For me, I think if they'd have gone into that full team, not done a tap on the front or as little as possible, gone in all guns blazing from there, I think it might have been a different story because there was points where it, on that Chapester, it whistled down to like 20 riders, but then they eased off because Del Toro went off the back and they had to save Wellens for later mm -hmm. on. I think if that would have changed, it would have changed the outcome. But I, I say luckily for us, it is luckily for us that it, that did happen what happened today because we got the final one that happened. I, I know, and also... Oh. I mean, how can they make it hard if they're not pushing on the front is the question. And they needed to make it really hard. And Bogacar mm -hmm. wanted it to be much harder than it actually was. You've got to give full credit to everyone else as well. And certainly the sprinters teams, because for the first time since 2016, we had a sprint winner, mm -hmm. sprint one, two. Um, you class him as a sprinter? Well, I do, though, I do. And, and I, I didn't, I, I deliberately didn't say on air it was a sprint finish mm -hmm. because it's not like a bunch of no, I said it was a sprint winner. Did I not? Did I? I, I, don't know. I, don't know. I, I tried not to, but maybe I let slip. Okay. Uh, but yes, for Phillips, and of course he's a sprinter. Of course he's a sprinter. He's one of the fastest sprinters. I think he is, but I I, 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 for me, he doesn't quite. He falls he into just above the sprinter. Okay, so hang on. Who don't, hang on. Who's the, who, who then? Malia. Malia. Yes, because uh, yeah. I beat Malia. Yeah, but this is the thing. But you, Malia can't come second in Lou Bay. But he's That's still, like saying Wout's a sprinter. Because Wout It's not, bumped, though. Yeah. It's not because Wout can't beat Jasper. He can. And but he has. He, not very often. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but Wout's a different kettle of fish altogether. Oh, here we not... go. We're all special <laughs> Wout. <laughs> <so, yeah. laughs> Sorry, yeah. Rob. Jasper yeah, Phillips was the best sprinter in the Tour de France last year. Thank you. He was, but also Peter Sargon was the best sprinter in the Tour de France, and he wasn't a sprinter, a pure sprinter. Oh, we're getting lost here. What a start to this. <laughs> <season. laughs> no, I know. 100%. Jasper Philipson is a sprinter. He can also diversify with other okay. things, but he's first and foremost a sprinter. Michael Matthews is first and foremost a sprinter. We had no. a sprint one, two. He is a, Michael Matthews is a sprinter who can also climb, which makes him great in, in sprint finishes that aren't flat street run-ins to the line. But he's, a, Michael Matthews is a sprinter. What else is he, a ruler? Puncher. No, he's not yet. He's not quite. He's not, he's not. Don't forget that Tour de France stage one, or that climb, really steep climb. Yeah. No sprinters getting up that. But do you remember everybody's surprised at that? And everybody said, wow, that's amazing for Michael Matthews because yeah. he's usually a sprinter. Mm. Is anyone yeah. Adam, that cycling's changed that much now that the yeah. riders have to be able to do more? And I think we said this in, in the live broadcast that there aren't many. I think you actually said, we looked at the start, this is how many top name big traditional sprinters are, and not mm. so many, maybe one, two, or three. And that wasn't paying any sort of lack of respect to the likes of Philips or even Olaf Koyresh really mm -hmm. well to it just missed out on this I think final. The way yeah, I think the way we want to, that I'm thinking of is pure sprinter. So sprinter and pure sprinter ability. Like you're thinking you, like a Chipolini or a Cavendish. Yeah, like Cavendish, Cavendish, Caleb you and Malia, pure okay. sprinters. The ones who can't really get over the climbs, you mean? Yeah, Quite so well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I don't want to leave it on. No, no, I'm going to get into trouble. No, no, but it's serious. Shit. No, but what, yeah. It's the less punchy true. sprinters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, this yeah. is the thing with cycling, which is so beautiful and so complex to anybody coming to it for the first time, is there are grades of sprinters. So you come to the sport for the first time and you think, okay, Maybe I can get it. There are sprinters, there are climbers, there are time trialists, and there are grand tour winners. And then you get into it and you think, well, yeah, but but he's that kind of a time trialist mm. and, and he's that kind of a climber and maybe, you know, the punchy climbs and not quite so much the alpines. And it's it's all shades of grey and whatever colour you choose. <laughs> and more. And more. And more. 52. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, can we just say, because we haven't even said it yet, we've sort of reversed into this. What a bloody marvellous finale that was today. Yeah. Genuinely, I was saying to you, every time, every time we get to a tense finale of a race, I genuinely think I hate this sport. I hate what it does mm. to me. And I hate the feeling that I get. So I have anxiety. I've had it all my life. This kind of a finish flares my anxiety and I, I forget until I'm right in the middle of it. And, and it doesn't matter to me. 
I'm not, I'm not with the rider. I'm not part of a team. I'm just a fan. But watching it, not knowing what's about to happen, especially when there's so many different scenarios that could still play out over the Chipressa, over the Podio, and in the run into the line, it's like, I don't think I can take it. And it's beautiful. I thought that was a magnificent edition of Ryan Sarema. Yeah, Loved same, it. Same. Well, for those who haven't really watched before, Milano Sarema, what's 288 kilometers this year? Usually a few kilometers long. They call it 300. Longest race of the year. And for a lot of the day, not much happened this year. Yeah. Just, especially us in the commentary box, yeah. trying to find ourselves talking about what we've had for breakfast and coffee and yeah, all this other yeah. stuff. We admire the scenery as it goes along. And for those of you who stuck with us all day, well done. <laughs> um, at the end, we expect those final fantastic 10 minutes on the podium at Ascent. Maybe we could speculate that it could be an exciting final half hour mm. with the Cipressa. And going back to your original analysis as UAE, not quite working out for them. That's where it went wrong for them today. They'd land, hadn't they? To ride it, they talked about riding it in less than nine minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the record or the time, that, the reference time that most sports directors are using was nine minutes, 19 seconds with David Affordable or having gone to the top really quick a few years ago and having had a group of about 20 riders maybe still in the race. Today, they were all set up to do that. They started putting the pace on the Trecapi, the three short hills in the last 50 Ks before you get there. But when they got to the bottom, they were sort of bullied out by other teams. They just took out of the way. That it took them, I would say, the first two kilometers of the Chipresa to get sort of organized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even when they did that, they didn't have the six or seven riders that I think we were all imagining in our heads, you know, the night before, oh, this is how they're going to ride it. This is how they're going to do it. Didn't happen, did it? Did we expect them to do that, though? Did we expect I them didn't to have the team to be able to do it against the teams that showed up and especially a trap? That showed up. You thought they could. Yeah, yeah. Really? Uh, they, they could have, but they just messed it up on the Capi. I think the last Capi over Capiberta, they got bullied out of it a little bit. They rode over the top and then the lead into Chipressa because they'd been riding so hard up the three Capis. They got onto the cr most crucial bit, let's say, mm. leading into the Chipressa, and they were just nowhere. Mm. Like, um, Kobe eventually got to the front with Pagaccia about four or five hundred meters into the Chipressa, but it took Wellens and Del Toro a good kilometer and a half to get up from there. Bear in mind, they started in. 30 or 40. So when Kobe's riding full gas, these teammates are trying to get to them rather than just backing off and saying, right, they're here now, bang, let's go. Or even if they started at the front, I think it would have made a world of difference. But I just think they, not overconfident. I think they wanted to make it hard. But ultimately, if you want to do the Chipressa as hard as possible, do the Chipressa as hard as possible. But don't do the other climbs at a tempo, which is then going to affect the ultimate goal of doing the Chipressa as hard as possible. So I just think... After that as well, they came into a situation, 25, 30 guys at the bottom, and they had one guy, Wellens, with Bogaccia. If they'd have had two or three teammates, and hammer down all the way to the podium, make it hard. Yes, they're sitting in the wheels, but as they got there then, everyone had just been, there's no chance for recovery, just sitting on that wheel full gas. So I just think that's ultimately where they slipped up a little bit today. I mean, I wonder what's going to be said in that team bus and at the team hotel after all of that, because Tade said it was too easy. You know, it was an easy edition of the race for him, which we all had a laugh well, at in the studio. Edition, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know. 46 kilometers per hour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely mad. 46.1 kilometers it was, wasn't it? The absolute record that stood, what, since 1990 in January. She was the way. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. says a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that he wanted it even harder and couldn't make it harder, what does that say as well about their tactics and about the team's support and the team selection? I don't know. But if it's the fastest ever, as you say, and it still wasn't hard and fast enough for him, how does he win Milan San Remo? Yeah, I, 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 I think the original plan. Like, to me, the original plan. If you put it down to yeah, okay, yeah, how they were execution. Yeah, I just think if, you, if yeah, you look at... Yeah. Um, Let's say going into a mountain that's six, seven K longs and it's like perfect for Bogaccia. They will start at the bottom of the climb and add full gas rim to make it really hard. They won't start 13, 14, 15 K before on the flat road to think, we'll make this a little bit hard for everyone and then go. They'll just go right, bottom of the climb, bang. Today, 13, 14, 15 K out, they started doing it already. And I just, why? Mm. You want to make it hard on one singular climb. Why are you making it hard before, which you're not properly going full gas? You're just hurting their legs a little bit. They've already done two of them to hit cake. Mm. They're all right. Everyone's going to be hurting. So that's my point. Yeah. Well, it was a climbing-centric team that was picked for them. I just wonder if, with the addition maybe of a ruler in there, who's capable of winning that fight yeah. for the bottom of the Chipres again. And again, this is what ifs. 
you know, who do they in the heat of battle, who do they have in that team to do that now? And there's Pollock. Yeah, Neil's Pollock. Yeah, good one. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know though. I think it was it just turned into such an evenly matched race in the end, you know. And and at um, Strada Bianca, we saw Tony Pogacar going in that eighty kilometer solo attack, and we were wondering. No disrespect to anyone else who was there, but what would have happened if we'd had a Mathieu there mm. or um, a Mads there even? And we got to see that today. And they were all incredibly well matched. Mathieu van der Poel, the defending champion, the world champion, he also couldn't make the difference, which Please is why. Yeah, I this know. guy, man. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> well, I would say, White shorts and mullets. We need to get to that in a bit, did, but anyway. Did he not make the difference, though? Because to finish off the story, him, he went over the, the podjo. He made that big acceleration when Bogacho really attacked for the second time, 200 meters to go. There's one or two more seconds hesitation there. Bogaccio wins, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made the difference to the ice cap, but he couldn't make the difference for himself, is what I'm saying. So actually, when you look at, we were looking at the top two, we're looking at Macho, we're looking at Taddy and saying it's all going to come down to those two, but it didn't. And everyone else played a fantastic race as well mm. to make sure that it came down to... Tade finishing in third and Mathieu finishing in tenth. So they were still there. Obviously, Mathieu racing in the end for Jasper Phillips. Sir. But I just think that actually it turned into a very, very well matched race in terms of strength, in terms of form, in terms of tactics, in terms of teams, which was an absolute joy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the outcome of the race as it went it was like the perfect mm -hmm. scenario for everyone watching at home, for Phillips and especially as well. I, it was just like the perfect race to watch so much happening. I think. I think the hardest thing for Pogaccia today was everyone knew what he was going to do and everyone was ready for it. So there wasn't a chance of something else. There wasn't a chance that anyone might try to do something else because what's the point? Tade Pogaccia is going to attack on the mm -hmm. Poggio. Soon as he hit that last little bit with a K to go, the real steep kicker, he will go guaranteed. And that's what he did, he did it last year as well. So everyone is just going to base everything around that. You know, it's getting to that. Anything else that happens before, as long as I'm still there, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Get to that point. If I can go over it, I can possibly win this race if he doesn't go clear. So I think for everyone today, and Pogaccio especially, it's everyone knows you're going to attack, but he's attacking against Van der Poel. He's attacking against Michael Matthews. He's attacking against sprinters. They, all of them have a better acceleration than Pog does. What Pog's got is that sustained high power output for a minute, two minutes. And I think that's the difference when Pogaccio can really make it when it's really hard for a long time and then go... The way you attack today, it's flat. Well, it's not flat. They go to the Padre, there's a couple of back acceleration from Wellington, and it's flat. So you have a chance just to get 20 seconds of not recovery, but right, here we go. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's just like waiting to get punched almost. You can brace yourself for the punch, and then it comes, and everyone's like, right, let's go. Here we go. This is it now. So I just, I don't know if it's the right tactic to, for Bagatcha maybe to go at that moment. It is the hardest point, but. He, yeah, I think you're right with the Tresser, really. That, that was the key. But he said at the start of the day he was going to wait for Poggio. Yeah. But, but you know, it hasn't worked. It hasn't yeah. worked. Surely we've got to have an attack on the Tresser and a sustained proper one that's, mm. that leaves no prisoners. I, no prisoners. Yeah. I think you could just tell out not easy it was. Not easy on the Poggio whatsoever. The amount of guys coming to the top and the backing up. It's the first time I've really seen it at the top of the Poggio like that where why did back off and then someone's able to go again mm. up there? It's, it's not happened in years, as long as I can remember back. So I think it's just that look around and going, oh my God, everyone's still here. Mm. Like, what, what do I do now? And his last chance effort was to go once more and hopefully stay around the downhill bit. Yeah, if you've got Beast Van der Poel, like the <laughs> first day of racing. And Mate and Pickpock yeah. and the downhill. Sobrero was there as well. Oh, I guess in the commentary, that would have been the most surprising Sanremo winner. Daniel also is getting very excited time. about that in studio, wasn't he? Very excited. <laughs> no, no, no. Mateo, Mateo. <laughs> well, you've had a wonderful day with Daniel Oss. I know that. Mm. We've had a wonderful day watching Jasper Phillips win. Michael Matthews was second, just in front of his good mate, who he travelled to the start with. Had a big batch up. And so they travel together. Oh, oh, that's really sweet. Your heart else is such big. <laughs> oh, they got in a car together. <laughs> oh, wasn't it nice? It explains why Taddy was posing for pictures with Michael's daughter and they were having a hug off at the end. I love that. Can we end up doing the Tour de France together? <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's, let's leave these to argue. And let's go to our first ever Gropetto interview. It's the winner, Jasper de Phillips, with Hannah Walker. Jasper Philipson, a first monument to your Palmares, Milano San Remo. Talk me through your emotions now and, and how that worked out. Yeah, it's difficult to describe. I think I have to uh, thank Mathieu van der Poel a lot 
for what he did to me. Uh, yeah, without him, wouldn't be uh, possible. I was just really happy with uh, how, how I felt, and then, yeah, I had the feeling it had, it had for me uh, mine uh, today. This has always been known as a, a sprinter's classic, a sprinter's monument, and over the years it's changed. We've seen solo breakaways, and it's really been one that suited and favoured the climbers. You've just proven that the sprinters can win here in Milano San Remo. Yeah, I know it's possible, but uh, yeah, it's only one shot uh, out of a lot of chances, so I'm really happy everything falls into place and that the race unfolds uh, my way, and I'm super happy. Talk me through those attacks on the Poggio. Tadej Pogacar was 6.5 kilometers, two big, big stinging attacks, and you were still there. Talk me through that moment. Yeah, I was really happy that uh, yeah, the attacks were on, but they were looking a little bit at each other at one point, and I was able to come back. So I, I dropped uh, a little bit. They couldn't uh, match the attacks, but uh, yeah, they look a little bit at each other, and I was able to uh, yeah, be there again. At what point did you and Machu speak to each other? Because we saw him do that big pull to bring Mohoric back, Pidcock, also Sobrero. At what point did you make that discussion to go all in for yourself? Yeah, I uh, let Machu knew I was there. Uh, yeah, that, that, he, that he had to uh, yeah, let nobody ride away or he would be uh, riding solo away. But yeah, I think we feel each other well. Um, and of course, it was also a gamble for him. But um, I'm really proud we could manage to do this as a team. So that's the first monument done. We've had a Belgian winner. Let's go back towards the start of the season now, because obviously this is our first episode, the first Gruppetto, the first time we're out the back. This is not the first time. Mate. Sorry, this is not the first time I've been out not the back. Not for you, no, but Gruppetto. Orla and I have, I have managed at there. least to make the final group today. So for us, it's the first time. Oh, look, and Orla, <laughs> she's even got her slippers on. <laughs> she's done it without <laughs> her aero <laughs> shoes. Honestly. Look at the state of her life. She's it's ready it. for the Giro as well. It. I've, got my, I've got my good old my pink, my pink like socks that. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brave socks. I was actually going to comment on your um, shirt. I didn't realise until a moment ago the hood was attached. This is this just is lovely. Really it was for sure. No, no, I just, no. I thought there was a hood coming out. I thought it was a shirt with a hood underneath. I'm not that sophisticated. I love it. I really like it. Very nice. Anyway. Anyway, and Adam, I love it. Yeah, next. Cycling. <laughs> yes, rewind back to the opening weekend in Belgium. And we had somebody turning up for the opening weekend who'd never been there before. And you think of her palmarès, which he, apart from maybe Merckx, is unrivaled. Mariana Foss, I'm talking about. She only turned up to the first race of the season, won it in fantastic style. And again, after the doubt to the latest layoff, you're thinking, oh, is that it for Voss? A cycling sort of caught up with her now. Este works dominating. And by the way, I think it's 11 race wins this year. Michael, producer, is that right? Yeah, 11 race wins. He's looking, he's nodding his head. <laughs> by the way, Michael, I know he's not like on camera, a <laughs> but he's, he's, <laughs> he's got a sort of Antonio Morgado moustache thing going on. It's a, on good, here. It's yeah. a good tash, I like he's it. He's going to be finishing fifth in a second division Belgian classic soon. <laughs> <laughs> Victor Campenart's tash. It is, isn't it, it yeah. actually? It's a good old Victor. Victor. Yeah. He yeah. can't say anything, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a nice change, eh? Happy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so back to Belgium. Yeah. Back to the opening weekend. And Mariana Voss, I mean, what is there left to say about Voss, uh, as he said already? Because she's still right up there at the top, despite the Kopecky and people like that dominating things elsewhere. That's the thing about her, actually, that I, that I love. And we've talked about this on air a lot. Her love for winning, her appetite for winning, the celebration that she gives as she crosses the line is magnificent. But she won in an era, okay, the predecessor to SD Works also, I mean, they've been the, been the dominant team in women's racing since forever. Um, but the way they are winning right now often makes them appear unbeatable and sometimes they are frankly unbeatable. So what Mariana does is even more impressive because we talk about the psychology of winning and the psychology of racing. To be able to believe that you can still, not single-handedly, she now has an incredibly strong team around her, but nonetheless, to be able to take a race like that into your own hands, to take SD Works on on her terms is what makes her so impressive because SD Works already going into opening weekend had dominated the UAE Women's Tour and we were already sort of scratching our heads and thinking, how do we make this really interesting? I mean, it's no disrespect to SD Works. It's full respect to them, but it doesn't become the most dynamic storyline if they continue to win. And then just when we needed it, opening weekend, Omelabit Newsblad, in she comes, takes the win, absolutely storming stuff. And we've written her off before. We've said before, that's it, she's had her time. And even then we were saying, goat. And that's, you know, wonderful. And now's her time maybe that it's caught up with her. And she comes back 
And now she's winning again and again. And, you know, after as well, taking wins at the, uh, a win at the first ever Tour de France fam. She's ticking off the things that a great should be ticking off. You know? I, I just think with her, she she started back in the era like when Nicole Cook was yeah, around. That yeah. is like Beijing Olympics 2008. She did the road race. I think she was second there. And I think if you go back all the way there, successful then and still successful now with a lot of that, with a lot of ups and downs. And that's for me, it's not the race wins that makes her the go. It's the way that she can still perform at the way she does. Yes, OK, if you look at it, greatest of all time on paper. Yeah, men's and women's like flat out the greatest of all time by a long margin. But it's the way she's able to race when she first started, win bike races, win for five or six years consistently then start to really struggle with other riders coming through, being challenged a lot more. So it wasn't that she stopped winning, but winning became a lot harder for her. And I think as the years have gone by, it's increasingly got harder and harder and harder and harder. And then if you look at now, before Omlu, we were just SD works, SD works, mm. SD works, SD works. We were getting bored of it almost because it was just like, we're going to expect them to be racing each other. She comes along, Voss. And it's not, if you get Voss in the condition she's in, it's not just Voss is there because she knows what she's doing. It is that, but she's got the legs to do it. And if you put them two together, it's done. Like It's done. There's like No matter how good Kopecky was that day, if she was 15, 20% better than Voss and she could not drop her, she's still not going to beat her. And, and as you say, it's that length of time. It's not just the duration of time and how difficult it is to maintain that winningness. Mm later in your career it's how much women's cycling has changed yeah. since she started racing and winning if you look that she was well before you know the women's world tour started in 2016 she's winning in 2008 even since the inauguration of the women's world tour women's racing has changed dramatically it has transformed almost as a sport in terms of the professionalization the teams that have risen to the top the training the knowledge the the science everything around it has changed so much so for her to still be winning with all of that transformation she is absolutely historically exceptional yeah massively i think she raced on the track as well you yeah, know. yeah 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 i think yeah. it was like 2007 yeah. she did the track but the track nowadays is rare well i say that Quebec is doing it right now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a rewind <laughs> <laughs> she used to race on the Rewind. track. really good on that. <laughs> but yeah, she's multidisciplinary. Yeah, and yeah. she's won across her multidisciplinary attempts. And, it, and it, it, she's just amazing. She's amazing. Say it again. Amazing. <laughs> and also she still brings her cat everywhere. Her dad and the cat and her brother in they the camper They still travel van. in the camper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah, it is yeah. nice, yeah. And her mum. I'd be interested to know, actually, if you think, or if anybody in the comments, by the way, wants to write and... They've observed, I'm sure, Foss's career and the different eras of cycling. Has anybody seen as much change as Marianne mm. Foss? I'm not sure. No, probably not, actually, because even Annemiek van Vleuten, who retired at the age of 40, she started racing later in her life. Um, Mariana has been around a very long time. I don't think there is anyone who's. And actually I say that Lizzie's across cycling, men's and women. Lizzie's the closest, I'd say. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah. Lizzie Diagon. Mm -hmm. She's probably the closest. Twenty. She did Beijing, didn't she? No, two thousand and nine. Yeah. I think she started professionally. So yeah, she's probably not too mm -hmm. far off, but a little bit behind her. Mm. No, incredible. And incredible since then has been Lotta Kopecky, uh, younger generation. Este Works, who just cannot stop winning. And it is so difficult if you're Foss or any of the other teams, you know, even Canyon Tram are strong as well. Yeah. They've got good riders, the Nivea Doma and people like that, young Beckstedt as well, mm -hmm. all sorts of top riders. And as you mentioned, it's a really competitive scene at the minute, but at the very, very top, like we've seen with UA and Visma Lisa bike over in the, see what I did there, Visma Lisa bike. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as we've seen <laughs> and the men's <laughs> side, it's just that final step, isn't yeah. there? And there's one mm. or two teams, one team really, that's just cleaning up at the minute. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, the encouraging thing is that the other teams that you mention are there or thereabouts. And I have talked a lot about Canyon Shram over the years and how frustrated I've been with them because I love the team. I love the setup. I love the, the development of young talent. I love the riders. I love everything about them. And so I've been very frustrated that they haven't been able to deliver on the wins. And I think the last year in particular, they've really taken a step beyond. And that's really encouraging. Trek as well are a team that I have shouted about 
for a long time. Again, really, really professional. A brilliant sense of teamwork within that squad. And again, just really likable characters. I think, and Ellen Van Dijk's back now. Yeah, yeah. Winning. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back from uh, having her first child. Amazing. So a few mums on that team. So I think we're not far off being able to break SE Works' as dominance, but we're not anywhere near there at the same time. However, if we get the rumours materialising and Demi Vollering maybe skipping camp to UAE Team Emirates, uh, to UAE ADQ, um, then that would change the dynamics an awful lot, I think, I hope. That would be a lot of fun. I, I think it would be a lot of fun, but I think she'd struggle massively. I, you, I yeah. really do think she'd struggle to win as many bike races as she does just because of the whole team set up, the riders around her, everything with it. It's like if... You know, like Chris Froome or whoever it was, moved teams. They've won the Tour de France, won something like that. They moved teams. Froome's a different case, though, isn't it? Because of the crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But just for Roglic or Roglic, even yeah. Phillips, we'll Phillips we'll are today. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You know, all the talk last week about maybe, ah, oh, he's putting himself up for sale. He's got Alex Carrera to, to sort of negotiate yeah. his next deal. And he's saying, oh, well, my future might lie away. If he looks at today and see what Fonda Paul yeah. did for him and racing yeah. in that team, it's the same thing. It's strength in numbers, certainly in the well, classics. Well, here's the thing SD works don't seem to be trying to keep Damey, do they? You know, they've already announced that Lotta is staying until 2028. Uh, if they wanted to keep Demi, they would maybe be throwing a lot of eggs in her basket right now. So maybe they're happy enough for her to go. Yeah, I've not heard this rumour mill about Phillips. And where was he rumoured to go? I'm well, going to guess. Basically, he was putting himself up for sale and saying, you know, I'm quite like where I am. I'm doing rather well. But let's put the price up a bit. Do you know he'd fit quite well into UAE, wouldn't he? Do you reckon? Well, he was there already quite as well. well yeah. yeah, I think he'd fit quite well in there. You think him and Pogaccia are obviously very good friends. Yeah. And I think they've not got that sprinter yet. Pogaccia, yes, he's he can win the Tour, he can win these races. But Philipson nah, would I run a very different programme until it got to the Tour. I think it would be a huge mistake. Would they Why? like a sprinter? For Philipson? Yeah. Look at how much he has benefited from having Mathieu doing his lead out. I, know, I just don't think he would have won million as much quid as or he two million quid. Well, yeah. yeah, fine. Then if money's talking, then that's absolutely a different ball game. If yeah. you're looking at winning, though, yeah, I'm not talking about life choices. <laughs> you but know, it is a life choice. Yeah, though, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I applaud anyone who does that. And you know, it's a short career. Absolutely, take everything you can. But he's not going to win the same without Mathieu. No, I, 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 I agree. Completely agree. He won't win the same, but. He could earn a lot and still win. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And I think that's what it comes down to, though. They don't. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of riders, if they're built, say, if I don't know, Philipson was on, let's say, 500 grand a year, and then UAE offered him 600 grand a year, I'm sure he'd go, I'll probably stay. But if he's on, let's say he's on, I don't know, 1.5 million now, and then UAE say, we'll give you two and a half million. You, like, it's a lot of thinking to do. You really have to decide how much you love the sport. And it, this goes back to all bike riders, right? When they go, oh, I just love it. I just love it. Do it for free. <laughs> like, come on, do it for free. You don't love it that much. Like, everyone loves riding a bike, but everyone grew up riding, loving it, winning. Take the money away and see how much everyone mm. loves it. Cause yeah, but that's it's, practicality it's as well, isn't it? It's life and you have families and you have you have to yeah, build yeah, a of future. Course. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. it was you, you used to be a sprinter. Not really, but sort of. <laughs> <laughs> you were. Don't do yourself a disservice. If you were in that position and that luxury position of you've just won Milan San Remo Match of Underpool could have ridden for himself world champion defending mm. champion but he's worked for you since the Poggio he's also put his backside on the line through the Tour de France last year but you've been offered double the money by UAE what would you do? Depends how long I can't put myself in his shoes but if I was him winning as much as he is I'd probably take the money and just think like you're taking that money you would still get the chances like today in Milan San Remo if he's there together with Pogaccio at the top of there Pogaccio might just say he's there you know they're good friends you have to remember that the good friends there's that mutual respect between them Pogaccio's built built he's paid to win bike races but if you've got a rider there who's faster than you he might help him coming into the Tour de France we've never seen Pogaccio's there or thereabouts all the time you'd have a couple of riders to help him coming into a lead out and let's face it, all the sprinters, everyone's always coming through. So he will start to eventually win less. Yeah, it'd be a huge less. mistake for UAE to bring a split team to the Tour de France when they nah. haven't won it for the last two years, wouldn't wow. it? Wow. Yeah, but Wout is Wout. I keep saying it. But this is, but this is the but thing, right? Jasper so Philipson is not Wout van Aert. No, no, no. Jasper Philipson cannot pull up a climb the way Wout van Aert can. It's very true, but I don't think that UAE need to pull as much. I think they only need one or two climbers. Yeah, with I mean, he's won it without that much team support before. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, let's wait to see, because I think it's a pretty strong stacked team that UAE Emirates are going to mm. send to the mm. Tour this year. While on the subject of money, 
quick recap back to start of February now. We're going to double our fee the... there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hang, on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <Nothing> left. <laughs> do you I take cards? Shut that. the coffees. Do you take cards? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, are that's you a blur. That's a blur machine yeah. to the beat machine, by the way. While we're at it, <laughs> where were we? Oh Start oh the dear. season in the school playground. By I the think so. Of it, I think. I know I think you so. are. You said you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think Adam needs a break time, uh, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. But we'll carry on for now. We're gonna have you a break in a toilet. minute. <laughs> I do actually. No, I'm good. I'm good. Sorry, apologies. Not that sorry, but carry on. <laughs> we're gonna have a break in a minute whilst we listen to a good old mate of yours because Philippe Gilbert sent us a video from the San Remo finish line talking about the very subject of money and it leads us to talking about the he's male dominance. He's got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he has got a lot of cash. Something Sorry, he carry on. Yeah, he's got a lot of it. Is that why you're such friends with him? No, oh. of course it's not. So what, how, how do you keep yeah. this lot in check? It's amazing. You see? <laughs> New fan easy. respect for all of them. <laughs> he thought I was rubbish before. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on here from Philippe Gilbert talking to us from San Remo. Hi, Rob. I'm here in Milan San Remo, we're on side with the guys and we've been talking about uh, some issues in cycling and uh, I think like uh, for the fair play um, it's not always eager uh, about uh, the number of stickers and the vehicles the teams have so I have a personal experience in 21 in the tour like it was a heat protocol on and uh, the, the organizers uh, decided to give more stickers to the teams and we received also stickers, but we didn't have uh, personal and, and cars able to, to drive to the tour. So we were like uh, with the same amount of, uh, of cars and help. And uh, some other teams got like up to 16 cars. And they planned to have uh, every 20 minutes service on every climb. So get, got uh, every 20 minutes ice, water, drinks, service, everything. So it makes a huge difference. And I don't think it's like fair because you give even more power to the richest team and it's make a big difference uh, between the equality of cycling. So maybe it's uh, interesting to speak about it uh, in the podcast and, uh, and uh, go more in details about it. We've been listening to Philippe Gilbert there talking about money. As far as he's concerned, maybe some teams having too much of it. And so far this season... He's want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Come you can respond to that. Yeah. He's taken the trouble yeah. to get in touch with us for our big debut and you treat him well, like... We're complaining about salary caps, were you, sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> Serious for a minute. Serious for a minute. He, he was talking about salary caps, maybe, there, in a roundabout way. He's obviously talking about... Certain teams, the teams that have dominated so far this year in men's cycling, Visma, Lisa Bike and UAE Emirates, having that little bit of extra budget to have extra people to fuel on the course. And we all know how important fueling is. It's the buzzword, isn't it, of professional cycling at the minute. What's your reaction to that? I know, it, let's say off camera, before they started talking about egg chasing, by the way, there was uh, <laughs> quite a bit of reaction to it. Adam loves rugby, by the way. Yeah, we got um, sidelined. Do, do you know what? No, I'm not even going to go into it because it's going to spark a rugby chat up. <laughs> I just don't want to have this rugby <laughs> chat right now. All is buggered across off to rugby and it's all she keeps trapping on about. Whenever she's got a free minute, it's rugby this, I've rugby that. I've mentioned rugby like once, twice today. Twice a minute. It's the last day of the Six Nations. Third time so. now. <laughs> Third time now. Adam, Adam gets possessive now. He's like, you don't belong over in rugby, you belong over here. Yeah, you do belong in cycling. All right. Yeah, I, quit I, that, that stuff. I'll take that. That's Good. nice. Thank you. But all anyway. Right. How much money belongs in cycling? Okay. Can I jump on my soapbox here? Please because do. at full respect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might get dusty. <laughs> Full respect to Philippe, everything he knows about this sport. I cannot claim to have a fraction of his knowledge or his experience, obviously. However, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> however, I'm just not on board with talking about salary caps, capping the sport. We need to talk about investment, about growing the sport, about making it bigger. Yes, maybe sharing the money around, but not by teams who enjoy a larger budget sharing it out finding different ways for the smaller teams to come through and get more investment and that's all about race structure team structure in the finance structure but if we're talking about capping anything I feel like we're so navel gazing sometimes in this sport whereby we see our pie and we see the slice of the pie. And I remember chairing this debate once at the UCI, which was like an open floor debate with all the main race organizers and all the main team bosses and sports directors. And essentially this discussion was supposed to be about how we grow the sport and whether there's a streamlining of the calendar and making it more Gen X friendly, whatever. 
And I was stunned by the reaction from almost everybody in that room who was more concerned about keeping their slice of the pie rather than making the pie That's my bigger. Pie. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering but, that was coming in. But it absolutely <laughs> drives me insane. We need to step outside of this sport. We need to see it in a global sporting context, in a global business context, and realize there is so much more that we need to be doing to grow it, not to contain it. When people started talking about the rumor about Damien Vollering being offered 1 million euros to go to UAE and all of a sudden straight away it's yeah but is that good for women's cycling? Does that trickle down to the grassroots? Come on if we've got one of the best riders in the world getting a blinking good salary for her career then we get proper talent coming through and seeing this as a viable alternative to football or American football whatever it might be and actually investing and growing in this sport. If we're talking about salary caps in a sport that struggles for finance or budget caps, and, and just one last thing, sorry, but what, uh, the third team that we didn't mention in the big budget teams is Ineos Grenadiers. Money is not a guarantee of doing well. So what are we going to say? Your budget is capped if you're successful. We'll let you keep the budget because you're not winning quite so much. It doesn't make sense to me. I do, I'm not a fan at all. We need to grow the sport, yeah. not, not restrain it. And just it. before we come to Adam, just to put some context there, Visma, Lisa Bike and UA Emirates have been, you know, Hoovering up the winds, Pogacar, Strave, Bianca earlier on. You've had success for McNulty. But, yet, mm -hmm. but, but of course, to refer to what you're talking about, Ineos, they've had a very poor start, whereas Visma Lisa Bike have turned up. Got that right again, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and they've, uh, they've had Jonas Vingegaard absolutely ripping things up. Ineos, of course, with the budget they have, pr probably underperformed. Again, you know, we're not being nasty here. Mm -hmm. Let's give them the course of the oh, season to on. perform. I mean, yeah, but it's... do you have, as an ex-rider, a bit of sympathy for, for Philippe there? Because, of course, if you're on a lower budget team, you know, you're not going to get the, the same drink and food stops as everybody else. As I mean, you know, we're, we're on a different kind of show. I'm going to give my personal opinion for once. Don't do that. I'm with you. You know, I think that... I am as well. Don't, things, don't get me wrong. Is, yeah. is there any sympathy there as an X rider, a position we've not been in yes. for Phil? There is. It's it's not just for Phil. It's for the riders that are doing the job. So what Phil's there complaining about is ultimately the UCI ASO, whatever race it was, are giving out car stickers. So you've got the car stickers for it for in each race, and you get a number of stickers. So in each, I don't know how many teams. So there are accredited vehicles belonging so to your team. Accredited vehicles. That means you're allowed to drive on the course. You're allowed to stop at certain points with a sticker on your car. In extreme weather heat protocol, you get to the point where you need more fluid on board, you need more drinks. Everyone can provide more drinks and more fluid. What Phil was saying is they give out so many stickers to all the team, let's say 10 each, 6 each, that not each team has got that amount of cars. That is, um, it helps them perform, but if in that race situation, I think for the, the UCI ASO, they need to say, right, how many cars has everyone got? Just go and ask the general manager, whoever it is, quick email around the teams, let us know if you want to give out stickers, but we don't want to give teams an extra advantage. If you're looking on the day, an advantage of being cool, keeping the riders, you know, keeping them fresh to, for more safety than yeah, anything yeah, for heat yeah. protocol, I think that should be fair enough across all boards, but it comes into them performance. But, is Phil's not complaining about salary cap and he's not complaining about how much budget the teams have all got because ultimately the budget's going to training camps, they're going to extra equipment, this, that and the other. Yes, it makes a difference, but the biggest difference in cycling, as it's always been, is riding your bike. Training as hard as you can be. You might not have this heat protocol stuff, but if you ride your bike enough and train harder than anyone else, you're going to be a lot better. So the heat protocol, everything like that, what Phil was talking about, I think they should you know, just check how many yeah. teams who have what to make it as far as they can. The rest of it, yeah, okay, salaries come into it, not being able to go to training camps, you might not be able to afford it, the team, then the rider might not be able to afford it because the salary's on. But that's the goal, right? To get better, to yeah, do that. Yeah, and also, there's, I, I think the question of fairness... Life's not fair. Elite sport isn't fair. I wanted to be an elite athlete as a kid. I wasn't good enough. Is that unfair? No, it's just the, the card I was dealt. You I'm still not complain about it a lot. I do, <laughs> and I'm still very competitive. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I'm never going to be a basketballer. I wasn't born with a height. That's not unfairness. It's just the lottery of life as well. Now, obviously, this is slightly different, but I think. <sighs> 
I'm very okay. fair-minded and I teach my kids to be very fair-minded, but I think we assume a natural order of fairness in the world where it doesn't exist. I think that's the thing. Like they've, they've capped the rate, In this situation, they've capped the amount of cars you can have on a normal day, but then they've taken the cap off. To make it fair for everyone, they've given the same amount of cars for everyone and then they've just lifted the cap. So it's like, here's one rule. Oh, there's another rule come in, so we're not going to make any rules on it. Mm. So it doesn't make sense in a kind of way. And I think that's why Phil's saying yeah. it's unfair, which I... I I do agree with the cap and number of cars in the first place. Cap them another time for how many you can have in. But the, re the rest of it, God almighty, throw money at this sport because yeah. it deserves it. Mm. I was saying as well, Visma Lisa bike, we have to congratulate them for the way they've spent the money, UAE as well, the results they've achieved. And I, the reason I mentioned Visma Lisa bike there is because Matteo Jorgensen is probably the best example. He's the guy that yeah, was yeah, very yeah. vocal mm -hmm. about it last year at Movistar. And, and I think he afterwards felt a little bad about having been so honest because his old team got a lot of stick when, you know, perhaps they just didn't have the resources to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But this you know? is the thing, right? And this again, like you said, life's not fair. You just got to get on with it. And you got to get that investment. But Jorgensen got on with it at Movistar. Yeah. He got himself a top 10 in Paris. He went to the team and this year. And he got himself a deal with the team that's exactly. winning. Yeah. Uh, and he, they got him, he got himself at Paris this year into the winner's position after having been sent to Tenerife to, to Mount Teide. All expenses paid. They looked after him. Whereas last year, he was doing his own training camps and things like that. So that is the best example of spending that money properly. And yeah, thanks for getting in touch, Phil. Contrary uh, to that, though, Valverde, how long was he on the top of his game for in mm. Movistar, a team mm. with that lower budget? He was still able to perform like that. I think it's just times have changed with training and everything like that, obviously. But just because you're in a lower budget team, if you go into a bigger budget team, it's not it's not magic. Yeah, yeah. It's just different. It's just more investment into Again. it. It's more money spent. But Valverde, you know, he didn't. He went on his own training camps, all that, like Jorgensen did. But he just got on with riding his bike and worked what worked for him. Yeah, but and again, Alpecin, they're, they're a classic example. A few years ago, they were a minnow in mm. the peloton. You know, they were the also runs. And then Mathieu starts to win. And we're all saying, well, it's the Mathieu winning machine. And it's not. It's spread all the way across the team. And they've got nowhere near the budget that the top yeah, guys yeah, yeah. do. And yet they're beating the very best in the world with their number two option today. Mm. Right, let's move on to the very best in the world because all this year there's been the talk of the big four going mm. to the Tour de France. <laughs> How are they getting on? We've had Remco Evenepoel starting like a house on fire, winning in Figueira de Foz. He then won in the Algarve. He was pretty good in Paris, you'd have to say. Maybe the team could have been a little better. And there's also the, the, the team time trial with the weather affected mm. stuff that affected the race as well. Primoz Roglic didn't ride until Paris. Top 10, but no better than that, which is a strange result for Primoz Roglic. Worst he's had in years. In a one-week straight stage yeah. race, yeah. Jonas Vingegaard well, went to a Gran Camino and, you know, he walked the entire Camino himself, I think, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he won all three main stages, yeah. Yeah. apart from the, the pr neutralised prologue, which didn't really count. Uh, don't say that to the winner, of course. <laughs> <laughs> didn't count for the general classification. And who else have we got? Ah, oh, yes, Tadej Pogacar, who has raced twice. Won once and ended up on the podium once as well. Um, how are they all getting on? Taddy's doing all right. Let's <laughs> let's put it like that. He's doing all right. I think if we're looking at the Grand Tours, Tour de France, I'm not getting overly excited about Taddy going for the overall. I think he'll go for it, but I think Taddy will go in just to win, win, win. Not really? really. I think if he loses time, he'll just fight to lose time. Is that because of the Giro before mm. that he's doing or is that yeah. just going to be... I think I think that as well, but also the the way that he's been the last couple of years, that step to Jonas is still quite a big step. And it's not a big step which is unachievable, but it's a step back where he has to take his foot off the gas a lot in terms of the way that he rides, the way that he adjusts himself to the bike. So I think Giro, full gas, try and win it. You've got two out of the three Grand Tours there. And I think when he goes to the Tour, he'll put himself in a position to go for the overall victory. But I just think if he loses a bit of time, he's not going to be upset about it because he'll just go every mountain stage, every chance he get, win, 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 win. But also with that, for me, that brings in is he going for the overall? Is he not going for the overall? Because yeah. you can't let him out of your sights and that draws Remco out, that draws Primus out. Which that makes draws it really Jonas hard for him out. to lose time as well. Exactly. Until he, well, Until he, he does. Be, unless yeah. he drops completely away. And so then I, you look at the rest of the team with Almeida, with yeah. other people riding as well. Um, yeah, it's a mightily strong team that yeah, they're planning know, to yeah. send. And I do wonder about the pressure that will come from the sponsors because it's all very well to win Strada Bianca 
with an 80 kilometer solo, nothing compares to winning the Tour de France. And I think really, in terms of bang for buck, you want your lad winning the Tour de France for the third time and finally bettering Jonas Vingago and getting the better of Visma Lisa back again. I just think no matter what else happens, for them, that has got to be the most important objective. I'd, of the I'd year. say yes, but at the same time, if Tade wins the Giro, massive tick yeah. and a tick for the sponsors. If he comes to the Tour de France and just says, "Look, I'm going to see how it goes. I want to be up there, but I'm going to try and win as many stages as I can." Let's say that that guy could get five stages, and, six but, stages, but maybe. Don't you think that would have to be his objective from the beginning? No, because, no, no, he can't win at all that way because that's what he's No, 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 to go for stages and give up the GC right from the very, very beginning and say, actually, this is going to be my strategy. Because the problem is, if he goes for the GC from the start, you've already run out of half of the Tour de France's options of winning a stage, for example. Mm. If you look at last year, and he was well beaten in the end, but we're looking at well into week two. I mean, when did he drop out of contention? In the third week? Third week, yeah. And so by then, you do you've got to race that far to know whether or not you're going to win the Tour de France when you know you're not going to and by some margin you don't have very many chances left to win a stage so it's a yeah. that's a really risky gamble I think he'll just try stage stage just try and win as many as he can along the way when he sees the opportunity I don't think he'll drop back to, to lose time okay, I just think okay. he'll get to that point where he's won so, so many classic Tade just, just, as just tade attacking races. it all hungrily yeah but I think last year he tried to calm it down a lot I've heard yeah. I forgot who I heard it from Last week, oh, I know I heard it from him, I'm not a name checker, so I don't know if they want me to say that or not. But he was saying in the tour a couple of years, last year, there was a lot of arguing and you could hear it verbally between Tade, yeah, Rafa yeah, Maika, yeah, 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 in the yeah, team about yeah, what yeah, they yeah. should do. Should they go on the attack? On should the they road, not go on the attack? Yeah. On the road. Mm -hmm. And other teams could hear it. And if you hear that, you're like, they are not settled whatsoever. So I think Tade, by the sounds of it, he wants to race like a loony. He wants to race like we see Tade now, just going for it all the time. And that is what I'm excited about him going to the Tour de France for. And with him racing like that, as you say, I can see the time cut approaching for us here in the Gruppetto. So <laughs> if we're going to make Listen, it, let's Rob, be I'll tell quick. You we've got loads of time. <laughs> let's be quick. <laughs> got a team car coming he's, the, he's the expert at calculating time cuts, Rob. Thank yeah, you very I much. Am, you I can see it, the big numbers on the board there. We're approaching <laughs> the odds. <laughs> Evenpool, Roglic, Vinga go very quick from you all there. Vinga go for the win. For the tour. Yeah, yeah Vinga go for the win. I think Roglic for second, partly because of what we're saying and, and the, the Giro is going to be one, if all things being equal, I think Taddy will win the Giro and that will take so much out of him. I think it would be abnormal to be able to be in contention for the Tour de France. So I think Jonas, Primoz, and I don't know if Remco will finish. I think Jonas, Pri um, Jonas Remco, Primus DNF. Really? Goes to the Vuelta again. And Tade may be third, someone else. I'm not too sure. But yeah, I think Remco and Jonas will be the top two for me. Wow. Well, thank you, Adam Blythe. Thank you, Ola Schnoe. When are we going to next year on the breakaway? Tour de Flanders. The, ron the Ronde. What was that? Tour de Flanders. What was that? <laughs> the Tour of Flanders. The Tour of Flanders. <laughs> I think that's the, the Tour Ronde of Flanders. Flanders. The Ronde van Flanders. The Ronde van Flanders. <laughs> but classic season is approaching <laughs> before <laughs> then. <laughs> classic season is approaching before then. We've got the Edri... Harold Becker on Friday. We're commentating on that, aren't we? We're commentating on that together. Beautiful. Check your schedules around the world for when that is on. Of course, you can follow our Eurosport Cycling account on social media that will tell you all the details of where and when you need to watch. Gent Wevelchems after that. Duarte of Vlander at then the Ronde of Vlander. That's the next breakaway. And, of course, we'll be back next week in the Gruppetto. These two will probably be off winning stages, so somebody else will be joining me. <laughs> for now, though, from me, well, thanks a lot. Winning at life. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next time. Beautiful, man. Lovely. Yeah, right. That was Very really good, fun. Norman comes back out.